Hello, everybody. My name is Claire Qualls. I am a sophomore studying chemistry at the University of Idaho and have been working in Dr. Ray von Wondruska's archaeological chemistry lab for about the past year. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the chemical analysis of artifacts related to the Chinese diaspora in the American West. You can see on this map right here, we have five different dig sites. So we're just going to be looking at a couple artifacts from each. It's not moving. One second. There we go. OK. Our very first site is going to be the San Jose Market Street Chinatown. You can see on this map this block where it was. And this project was headed up by Barbara Voss. This right here is a historical picture of the site in 1887. Um, Anti-Chinese sentiments ran very strongly in California during this time period, and this fire was an act of arson, um, and it did burn the majority of the Chinatown to the ground. Here are the three artifacts from this site that we analyzed and have in this presentation to speak about. Our first one here on the far left was about a 10 milliliter flask, and it was full of this black crumbly material. Chemical analysis of this black crumbly stuff showed that the material was primarily carbon, but it also had an ash component made up of iron, magnesium, copper, sodium, and calcium, and those components existed as oxide, silicates, and carbonates within the material. So what this chemical analysis leads us to believe about this sample was that this right here is a compounded medicine with charcoal composed with various and uh, various other minerals. It is widely used in TCM or traditional Chinese medicine as an antidote for poisons and a treatment for ulcers. So activation makes uh, charcoal much more effective, but this strategy and wasn't really developed until the end of the 19th century. And this sample showed no evidence of activation, meaning it was prior to the end of the 19th century. Here is our second artifact. It is a typical single dose Chinese medicine vial and it contained less than a milligram of an orange red powder. Atomic absorption spectroscopy showed the material inside this vial to be red lead oxide. So red lead oxide exists as a mineral minium, which is a traditional Chinese medicine mined in these different provinces. It is widely available still to today and is used commonly in treating wing, ringworm and ulcerations, but that practice is more limited due to its toxicity. And that also explains this very small vial size to limit the dose. Our third artifact from the San Jose Market Street Chinatown site was this very irregular TCM vial. It contains 2.19 milligrams of a gray brown solid inside of it. Heat treatment at 800 degrees centigrade turned this material dark red and atomic absorption spectroscopy showed the presence of iron. So these are kind of two clues that are building up to our conclusion of what the specific material inside the vial was. We first know that under high temperatures, it turns dark red. Atomic absorption spectroscopy showed the presence of iron. And then the material inside was found to be magnetic, which is our third clue into figuring out what it is. The infrared spectroscopy showed silicates in there and additional solubility and spectroscopic data showed that the material was magnetite, which is one of the forms of iron that is magnetic. So magnetite is a TCM stone drug. Here are the Chinese characters for magnetite and is used internally for a multitude of purposes, but it has continued to be used as an elixir to, and I quote, anchor and calm the spirit, relieve restlessness, palpitations, insomnia, tremors, improve hearing and vision, combat and to combat chronic asthma. It is mined in these provinces in China. Moving on to our next site, we have the Jacksonville, Oregon Chinese Quarter. This project was headed up by Chelsea Rose. Here on this map of Oregon, you can see in the southwest corner is our site. Again, we have a historical picture. There is a fire happening in this one, but this one was thankfully not due to arson and was simply an accident. Uh, here is a modern way marker just describing the area and different things that were happening in the Jacksonville, Oregon site in 1865. Our three artifacts from the site are very different from one another um, and have to be evaluated differently. For our first one right here, we have a crumbly orange solid that contained lead, mercury, and it was almost entirely organic or carbon-based. Um, when this material made from this part here was placed in uh, a muffle furnace and burned at 800 degrees centigrade, it was almost entirely consumed. When that happens at this high temperature and almost all of the material is burned away, you know that almost the entire artifact itself was organic material because it cannot withstand that high temperature. It is likely that the lead, the presence of the lead came from a glaze on the ceramic dish and is not um, uh, from the material that was the dish was holding. 
This material was identified as stamp ink, ink used to seal documents in China since ancient times. This ink paste is called yimi. These are the Chinese characters for that and has been referred to as the paste of eight treasures. So those eight treasures are cinnabar, pearl, musk, coral, ruby, moxa, castor oil, and a red pigment of different sorts. Here we have a modern example of what the stamp ink would have looked like. It is not always, there. all eight of those treasures do not have to be in the paste to make it official yini, but there are always some of them present. In the case of this artifact that we analyzed, we did have the presence of cinnabar, also known as mercuric sulfide, um, and that gave the paste this orange red color. The organic components could have come from moxa, one of the other eight treasures, um, that also could have come from castor oil or a different organic pigment. Our second artifact here is a really interesting one. It was field identified as part of an opium pipe, um, but the inside the lab, different chemical analysis showed a pretty different result. This part right here, we're just looking at different angles of the same artifact. This part right here is a lime and silicate ceramic base. It has a narrow tube connecting the remnants, and this tube had some little remaining bits of a fabric wick. So this circular disc had a knurled edge here, and it was twistable. So what this actually was identified in the lab to be was a small paraffin or alcohol lamp or burner. So this projecting part here would have been mounted on a ceramic base or probably a fuel tank. This top portion may have had a detachable glass shade sitting on top of it, but that is simply speculation because none of that remained. And you would twist the knurled edge right there in order to make this wick longer, larger flame or smaller, uh, shorter, shorter wick, smaller flame. Our last artifact from this site was a very small piece of crumpled, brittle metal strip. It had this tan coloring on the outside, but when you rubbed it, you could see the dark, uh, the internal material was actually a very dark color and it was very thin. Atomic absorption spectroscopy showed that this material was lead primarily, and then it had a thin tin coating. So past uses of lead foil, which also contains small amounts of tin, are actually for the coverings on a cork of a wine bottle to prevent in fact insect infestation as they would be able to burrow through the cork, but not through the lead in the tin. However, this was very common practice up until 1980, but then people realized it really wasn't a good idea to have lead or tin near foods that you'd be consuming or liquids. Um, so then this tin coated lead was replaced by aluminum. However, it took about it, almost 20 years for there to actually be laws forbidding the use of the tin coated lead foil on wine bottles. Um, so it was advised against during this time period, but still widely used until 96. Our third site is the Eureka, California Chinese community. This project was headed up by Sarah Hefner. We have a map over here of California. Eureka is up in the northern part. Here's a historical picture of the site and uh, the settlement was very populated in 1850 due to gold mining. The population rose to around 10,000, but in 1870, only 20 years later, it had declined, declined to 1800 and 14, 1,440 of those people were Chinese. So the population was predominantly Chinese. Here are the three artifacts from this site. They're all vials with different contents. Our first one is this pill bottle. You can see the pills here, and here's one cracked open. The pills were sugar-coated, this brown part you can see externally, and the excipient contained calcium and magnesium. The IR spectrum of the internal components of this pill were identical to that of senna glycosides. Senna glycosides come from senna, which is a flowering plant. Both the leaves and the pods, you can see a picture down here, um, contain the senna glycosides. <clears throat> And this is used to relieve constipation. These leaves can be consumed in multiple different ways, pills, teas, making uh, drafts of it, or just eaten directly. Um, they've been used as laxatives since about 700 CE. Um, and here are the Chinese characters for senna. It has been used in TCM for a long time, but it's not actually considered to be an ancient drug. Um, this shrub can be found throughout India, Pakistan, and China. <clears throat> Pardon me. Our second artifact was this vial here containing a heterogeneous green and gold mixture of this, um, these flecks. When dissolved in hydrochloric acid, it produced a sulfur smell, which indicates the presence of sulfur in the material. And atomic absorption spectroscopy showed the presence of both iron and copper. So this powdered material in the bottle was identified as calcopyrite. You can see a picture of a solid form of calcopyrite in the bottom right hand corner. And you can see the varying gold and green colors in there that are represented in those flecks. 
Chalcopyrite is in a suite of stone drugs that are traditionally used in TCM, and it is taken to regulate and strengthen the liver. Our third artifact from the Eureka site is this small bottle, which I find this artifact very interesting, a small bottle containing a dark red viscous liquid that did not, contour, that did not contain mercury of iodine, um, but rather it had a very large amount of sodium. It fluoresced strongly with a spectrum identical to that of cochineal red. So cochineal red is a food coloring that comes from these very small insects called cochineals. They are crushed up and they can be used in paints, crimson inks, um, cosmetics externally, and as well as food, which would obviously be used internally. It exists primarily as a sodium salt. And here you can see a historical picture of a um, red food coloring bottle made from this cochineal red that you can see in our artifact. Our next site is the last one from California. This is our Redlands, California, Chinatown. This project was headed up by Karen Swope. Uh, you can see here on the current map of California, this red box indicates where the Redlands Chinatown is. And here is an excerpt from the Redlands Daily Facts that reads, in the Redlands area, as in California generally, anti-Chinese sentiment ran strongly in 1893. Many white men were unemployed and claimed that the Chinese were depriving them of work. So it really gives you a good idea of the, the community and the climate of this area at the time. Another historical picture of the site and our three artifacts that we're gonna be taking a look at. All right, so for our first one, we have this um, bottle that contained this white powdery material. Uh, infrared spectroscopy showed the presence of carbonates in here and atomic absorption spectroscopy indicated both calcium and magnesium. There's some silicates in there, but there was no phosphorus. Chemical evidence indicated that the white powder was a mixture of magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate, and it had some silicate contaminants in there that have likely leaked into the bottle over the years. These carbonates are commonly used as dietary supplements for both the calcium and magnesium or for their antacid properties. For our second one, we have a really unique opportunity to analyze this one because we have a rusted screw cap that was still intact. When you get a vial like this with the with the cap still intact, it's really exciting because the material inside is likely almost identical to what it was years ago when it was originally sealed. The liquid inside the bottle was a colorless aqueous solution and carbonates and sodium and potassium were found in there. So sodium bicarbonate, which is just commonly referred to as baking soda and potassium carbonate are both met, used medicinally to ease indigestion and heartburn. For this to be done, they're usually dissolved in water and then ingested by drinking it. This yellow color that we see in the powder was likely not in there originally, but originates from the iron from the rusted screw cap seeking, seeping into the liquid. Our final artifact from this site is this very tall, thin bottle. We weren't able to make out what it said on the sides, the embossing there, but through rubbings, we can see that one side says Ray Umberto and the other one says Pure Amid Bottles. This bottle contained a small amount of a soft brown solid and gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, and IR analysis showed palmitic, mysteric, and pentadecanoic acids in there. So those three acids are all known components of olive oil. Ramberto was an olive oil trade name belonging to the Strom Iron Arp Company of New York. Advertisements claimed that the oil was imported, which you can see on this historical advertisement on the right-hand side, but it didn't state where. However, the name Re Umberto suggests an Italian origin, likely referring to King Umberto I, who was the son of Victor Emmanuel II. Stromire and Arp Company, which only has 24 employees to this day, it still exists in New Jersey, but they are no longer selling olive oil, but rather waxes, honeys, canned food, and things like that. Our last two sites are a little bit closer to home. These ones are from the Sand Creek, Sand Creek Peninsula and the Boise National Forest archaeological dig sites. These projects were headed up by our very own Mark Warner and Renee Campbell. And we have these three artifacts here. For our first one, this powdery material found inside the vial lost 43% of its weight at 800 degrees centigrade and turned reddish. As referring to what we spoke about earlier, when something loses 43% of its weight in the muffle furnace at 800 degrees centigrade, that likely indicates that about 43% of that material was organic in order to be consumed by the heat and fire. Atomic absorption spectroscopy showed iron, lead, and calcium in there. This material partially dissolved in a mixture of hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid, but not entirely. And infrared spectroscopy showed some organic comp components and carbonates. Knowing that there are those or organic components in there from the IR spectrum reinforces our thoughts earlier about 43% of the mass being burned up in the muffle furnace. 
So this bottle contained carbonates, oxides, activated carbon, and a trace of silicate. The last part, the largest part was carbon and based on its burning characteristics and weight loss in the furnace. So the lead content was likely due to litharge, which is listed as a TCM stone drug. The mixture must have been originally dispensed as an aqueous slurry, so this powder would have been combined with some water and drank quickly, um, and it was taken as a stomach medicine or a hematinic. Our second artifact was a very small little vial here. It's about a little over two centimeters tall. Atomic absorption spectroscopy and a reaction with hydrochloric acid indicated carbonates in this powdery material found internally. When something is combined with hydrochloric acid and it bubbles vigorously, that is what shows us when you have carbonates in there. The material fluoresced in the visible when excited at approximately 254 nanometers, but and it mostly dissolved in aqua regia, which is a very strong acid solvent. This material contained zinc, lead, and a trace of magnesium in there as well. So a stone drug compounded from lead and zinc containing materials, primarily carbonates, but possibly others as well, was the eventual conclusion of what this was used as historically. Um, lead and zinc are both used in traditional Chinese medicine for a multitude of different reasons. Lead is used for some mental health things such as manic depression, epilepsy, but then also as skin for treating skin diseases. And zinc is an essential mineral and would have been taken for some of those reasons as well. Low zinc levels can be associated with male infertility and zinc would have helped in wound healing and immune function. However, these materials are slightly toxic, so that accounts for this very, very small vial size to prevent the user from incidentally taking too much. This is the last artifact from the Idaho archaeological dig sites and the last for this presentation. We have a, a brown brass pipe which contained this mortar plug and an irregular hole in the center. There's a small little bit of brown material left inside there. So we're going to speak about the brown material first, the residue. So that brown residue contained alkanes and iron in a high concentration, carbonates, silicates, copper, and magnesium. Now looking at the device itself, the brass part, a speculative interpretation of this device is that we have this brass tube. You would insert this clay or mortar plug into the center of it. And then a small rough hole was punched through that with a rod or stick, which would connect this one compartment to another with that mortar plug in the center. So with these two combined compartments, the user would be able to have placed some smoking material, maybe tobacco, marijuana, or opium, and it would be placed in this side, lit, and then the user would place their mouth on the other side, inhaling through, and hopefully that plug would prevent the burning material from being inhaled and burning the user. It is potentially, it is, there, there's some thought that maybe it, this brass pipe was used for smoking marijuana. It's purely because that brown residue, that burned material found inside contained a large amount of iron and marijuana is a known drug that contains lots of iron. I would just like to say a couple quick thank yous. First, the Almaquist, Almaquist bequest. We didn't end up traveling for this conference like originally planned. We're still very grateful for the funding for it. Carl and Kirby Dias, again, for some funding and Mark Warner, our resident archeologist who has been helpful in the exploration of many of these artifacts. Thank you so much for your time.